Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Our guest today is Tom Newman, who is an ordained spiritual minister, certified medium, healer, and teacher. Tom studied at the Arthur Finley College and holds a bachelor's degree from the University of South Florida, an MBA from Nova Southeastern University, and a Certificate of Executive Education from the University of Virginia. He's been a passionate spiritual explorer and investigator for well over 50 years. He worked as the executive director of the Sarasota Center of Light for 17 years and in 2013 moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. He teaches classes and continues to do readings either in person or on the phone. As you'll hear in this interview, Tom loves to share his extensive spiritual knowledge insight, and spirit communication with others. And I'm especially interested to hear his experiences with physical mediumship. You can find out more about Tom on his website, which is TomPNewman.com. Tom Newman, my friend, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hello, Sandra. How are you? Good. It's so great to connect voice to voice again with you. Yes. And actually, I have my website has another address, which is a little bit easier to get to. It's teachingsoftheangels.com. Oh, that's super easy. Teachingsoftheangels.com. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Right. How, sure. do, how does your story begin, you getting involved in this whole wonderful world of spiritual things? Can you take us back and well, tell us about you? Oh, sure. I had a very insightful uh, mom. Um, my parents divorced when we were five, so there were four children, and basically, um, you know, um, our mom um, raised us and helped to instill uh, an interest in spiritual subjects. She um, she was never one to get caught up with uh, dogma and creed. She'd started out um, in a very orthodox faith, but... By the age of 19, she had decided that that faith was not um, feeding her spiritually, and so she began her own search. So we started going to the Shrine of the Master Church in Tampa, Florida. It was um, a church started by Russell and Dorothy Flexer, uh, both ministers in spiritualism. They were part of the Spiritualist Episcopal Church, which was started in 1941 by Clifford Bias, John Bunker, and um, uh, Robert Cheney, who he was the one that he and his wife started the Astara Foundation in California. And it was interesting at that time, I'll just take a little detour there, They um, Dorothy was a trumpet medium, and um, so she would go into trance. She, she studied with Ethel Post Parish, uh, who was the one who started for Bell, a uh, spiritualist community in Pennsylvania. And um, it was interesting that the um, the group that started the Spiritualist Episcopal Church, they felt that in addition to reunions, and that's what was the main focus of a lot of um, trumpet mediums and materialization mediums, they felt that the spirit world had a lot to teach us, um, knowledge that would help us along this pathway of life. And so that's where the flexors put, they and their spirit teachers put their emphasis. So Dorothy, when um, I had the good fortune, we started going to the church in Tampa. Um, It was started in 1947. They started one in Sarasota, Florida in 1949. So at the age of 11, which was 1963, I started going to the, the mediumship class every Monday night in uh, Tampa. And again, Dorothy would go into trance. Her spirit teachers and our teachers would um, would present the class. They'd give us exercises and we'd work, everyone would work individually with their spirit doctor. Um, say, the, say Dr. Davis was, Charles Davis was Reverend Dorothy's doctor. And he would say, okay, we're going to work with occupations. So we would Um, One at a time, we would tune in with our spirit teacher, our spirit guide, uh, mostly the spirit doctor, 
and we would try to pick up occupations and then place them in the room as to who they went to in the room. Now, the room was a totally darkened room, as anyone knows. Um, most energy work and all ectoplasm work has to be done in the dark. Um, there, the one exception to that would be some um, trumpet mediums and demonstrate in the red light, but it takes a lot more energy. So we would, you know, we would stand up and say, well, I feel, you know, such and such occupation, and I feel it goes to so-and-so. And And then um, we'd give any other information we could pick up, and then our doctor would come in and explain to us whether we got it right or not. Tom? And give us um, encouragement, yes. Yeah, I just, uh, just in case this is someone's first show, um, could you just explain what uh, trumpet circle is and also when you say the doctor would step in what what do you mean by that okay great um the trumpet mediumship is where spirit would put the medium in trance in a darkened room no light no visible white light uh in the room and um they would draw ectoplasm from the medium's body and the ectoplasm is made by the pancreas it looks like white a white gauzy material And then they would build a pillar or a column um, with part of the ectoplasm. They had two trumpets in the room. They're aluminum uh, trumpets. Generally, there are four sections collapsible. And they'd be about five inches across the bottom in width and about one inch across the top. And the entire trumpet was about three and a half feet long. So they would levitate the trumpet that sit on top of the pillar Then they would take some more ectoplasm and create a vocal box and put it inside the trumpet. Then they would run two strands of ectoplasm from that vocal box to the medium's vocal box. But essentially, the spirit people who would speak through the vocal box in the trumpet, they would have a mask that they would put on, and then they would speak through that. Um... And so that's how the class went. You know, they would take turns speaking through the through the trumpet. Now we all have um, spirit guides. All of us do, and there are six primary guides. Um, there's a spirit doctor. There's a doorkeeper. There's a doctor of chemistry. There's a master teacher, a healing guide, and a, generally a Native American uh, guide for protection. But the spirit doctor is the one who, he coordinates the entire band of guides. And there are secondary level guides also. And they would focus on individual activities that the um, the human person, person on the earth, would be focused on. Like if, if someone was wanting to um, write a book, then they would be, they would, they would seek a writer, someone with writing experience, to work with um, their instrument, which would be the us. And if there was harmony between us energetically, then that spirit guide would stay with us until we got the book finished. So that's kind of a little brief overview there. I, I appreciate you talking about that because I'm always mindful that so many of the listeners has, have been listening for three to four years of the show and we've talked all kinds of things but as a first time listener you might think what are they talking about and believe you me yeah a couple years ago I wouldn't have even been able to get my head around this but what we really are talking about to our listener is our loved ones in the spirit world making their voice real again and being able to communicate with their loved ones and um, I have witnessed it and it is one of the most special things and miraculous that I've ever experienced. So, anyways, back to you, you my know, friend. Sandra, the nice thing about this, too, um, this isn't new. I mean, if you if you um, look at the, close one eye and look at the scripture <laughs> uh, in the Bible, Christian Bible, you'll see that there were other examples of physical mediumship being being demonstrated and um, like they could take uh, paper and roll it up and it it could be sheepskin papyrus something like that and um, speak through those instruments 
also. They're just used to magnify the sound. So pretty, pretty cool. much as long as Didn't humans, human beings have been around, uh, there have been those that were um, blessed with the ability to do physical mediumship. That's fantastic. Yeah. So what happened with me, um, I sat in those classes every every week, every Monday night. I was fascinated. You know, even at the age of 11, I was just fascinated. My peers were home watching Lost in Space and other, you know, Bonanza and other programs. And I was down talking to the dead on Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they would say um, most Spirit people have really a good sense of humor, especially the guides. Yes. They would say, the, you people on the earth are the dead ones. We're alive. That's We're right. We're very much alive. That's right. But um, I sat in those classes until the age of 23, and I moved away for four years. And then I came back at 26 and moved to Sarasota, Florida, which is where the flexors had made their home. And they would drive up. One would drive up on Sunday and serve the Tampa Church, and the other would serve the um, Sarasota Church on a Sunday night. So there they had two classes a week, one on uh, Thursday, mediumship class, and they had one on Wednesday night. They had a healing service from 7 to 8 in the sanctuary. And then after the healing um, class, um, healing service, there would be a class where master teachers would come in from all over the universe. And uh, many of them would be connected to the people in the class. And they would come in and ask for a topic. And say, your master teacher would come in and say, Sandra, do you have a, a topic for me or a question? And um, if you did, you would give it to them, and they'd speak for eight to ten minutes on that topic. Uh, fascinating, fascinating um, information that would come through. So we sat in, in those classes um, until I was, uh, let's see, 44 years old. Oh, my gosh. So from 26 to 44, I would be in two classes a week, you know, unless I was out of town on vacation. Mm -hmm. But it, I figured I probably sat in over 3,000 classes being taught by spirit. And uh, the nice thing was um, we recorded those master classes on Wednesday nights for 20 years. And so the, the Sarasota Church, it was originally the Shrine of the Master of Sarasota. It, um, its name was changed in 2006 to become the Sarasota Center of Light. And uh, so they have a, a massive library of um, spirit masters teachings. So in 96, in 96, Dorothy made her transition. Dr. Russell had made his transition in 1977. And so um, I had been an ordained minister for um, a year, or something I, I worked for several years to obtain. And so I took over as the um, senior minister of the, of the church in 96. And I also had a career with Verizon uh, in their engineering and construction um, program. Most of the time I was um, a senior manager in, in that role. So for 10 years I did both jobs, which made life very busy, and then retired from Verizon to early retirement in 2006, and then worked full-time um, at the church there in Sarasota for another seven years before coming to Santa Fe. The Tampa church closed in the early 90s, and it was just a matter of being really too difficult for, for Dorothy to, you know, adequately um, lead both both churches. So that uh, the emphasis and the energy was then put totally into the Sarasota church. And uh, I stayed, um, and Dorothy could do materialization, which is where Spirit would, similar to the trumpet, um, they was trumpet mediums, they would take the medium into trance, draw the ectoplasm out, and they would pull it um, at their feet. And then spirit individuals could stand in the ectoplasm, and their etheric body, which is one of the energetic bodies that make up our soul, the etheric body would be covered with ectoplasm. And they would essentially take on physical form. 
They could walk around the room. They'd speak with their own vocal cords. They could touch you if, you know, if they asked your permission. And um, so I had heard, I had heard that Dorothy did this um, several times, but I was always in school or out of town or, you know, just not able to attend it. So in 2007, I had, um, I guess in 2005, I had developed a friendship with, uh, through another friend with two fellows in, um, in York, England, Eric Cargill, who's a deep trance medium and Gerald O'Hara, who's a, an author. And, um, they told me that David Thompson was doing a three week tour of, of England and going to be doing seven seances. So I said, I don't care what it takes. I've got to get a seat in one of those seances. Right. Right. And, so you know how that goes. That's exactly so what I it, did. Yep. <laughs> uh uh-uh. Well, it happened, yep. and uh, I um, I got a seat in one that was in Newton Abbott, and my friend Tim, who was from New York but lived in Sarasota, he and I flew over for it, and uh, oh my gosh, what an experience that was. Well, I, we we want to know why you believe in the afterlife. And maybe you could give some stories of maybe even your first seance with David, the kind of things you witnessed, because it's they're so incredible. We love stories here on the show. Yes. Well, the uh, the thing you know, the good thing about being eleven and not having any—I mean, I was always interested in you know the Bible stories. wasn't wasn't really a daily reader of the Bible. I was really interested in the stories, and um, but I didn't have any dogma. I didn't have any um, um, orthodox beliefs that got in my way of believing in this, you know, believing in spirit communication and physical phenomena. So, you know, there's something about I think each person we have a. Um, we have a sense about us, and I think that comes from the soul. No matter how old we are, you know, we can tell when something makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Yes, I believe that. And from, you know, I, I really think we can. And uh, I think many people underestimate their audience. And, um, but even, you know, from a, from a, um, and when you listen to, uh, like Dr. Davis speak, or my, my spirit doctor's doctor, Henry Meredith, when you listen to him speak, um, they speak with such wisdom and such kindness and such, uh, you know, knowledge that um, you just know it's true, you know? Yes, you're right. Um, so I never, I have really, I've never had an issue with any of the experiences that came from through the Flexors or through David, um, you know, David Thompson. The um, and of course, there's you know a thousand stories uh, about you know individual experiences. And the nice thing with the flexors is that um, you could ask Dorothy for a private session where just you would be in the. Uh, they built a chapel for her mediumship, but you just you would would get a private reading. She'd go into trance, and your spirit people would come in and speak to you. You know, and they would come in and speak about, you know, I would have a lot of personal questions about this and that. And, you know, Dr. Meredith would know everything that I was speaking about, even though it had never been discussed in a class. Mm -hmm. You know, when it came time to, you know, look at at, um, where do I go after I get my college degree and, and, um, you know, choosing a particular major and things of this nature. The nice thing about the spirit world is that they honor, they have to honor your freedom of choice, your power of choice. It's called free will. So I've never had spirit tell me to do something. They've strongly suggested that I do something. And um, I've always followed them, always. And, um, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's very reassuring. I'm sure you've seen this. Say today, there's a deep trance medium in um, um, Maryland who 
demonstrates in Arlington, Virginia, at the Arlington Metaphysical Chapel. His name is Steve Woods. He goes into trance, and he's a deep trance medium, and <clears throat> what they do is um, one at a time, one of your guides will come in and trance through him, and you can ask him three personal questions. Well, what's reassuring is when a guide comes in and we discuss a subject that I've discussed six months earlier, you know, with Dr. Meredith, or I also work with um, Karen Cook in Albuquerque. She trances uh, the Archangel Gabriel, and and he says the same thing. So they're all saying the same thing about me, you know, about a particular thing I'm working on. So, I mean, that's... Um, I've never really needed to seek evidence in those type of experiences, mm-hmm. but it all comes comes back, you know, confirmed, all very, very much confirmed. Um, would you like to hear a David Thompson story? Well, I'd like to hear many. Uh, you know, I just want to say well, one thing. The intelligence of the spirit world is something that is so remarkable. I mean, I've even had times whether it's through trans medium or in a physical seance that they know what I'm thinking, you know, it's, yeah, it's crazy, but so reassuring. Yeah. It, and also, um, during the show, would like to talk about David Thompson, um, coming to the States if people are interested in seeing him. And so maybe within your stories, you can maybe give us an overview of what happens during a, a seance. Cause that word seance, I think can evoke, some images that aren't really of what they are. So, yeah, tell us some stories. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think it's a French word meaning, m- meaning meeting. Yes. Going to a meeting. That's right. Um, but you're right. There's a lot of um, misunderstanding about that word. Um, the um, Well, let me give you the overview of what happens in a David Thompson seance and then and then I'll tell you a couple of stories that uh, were very just mind blowing. Um, David grew up in England, and about thirteen, fourteen years ago, he moved to um, Sydney, Australia. He was there for ten years. Then he moved. Um, he married a um, beautiful lady in Auckland, New Zealand, and he's been there for the last three or four years. And um, David was what they would refer to as a natural medium. He was born with an ability. Um, I don't like the word gift because um, even though he was born with an ability, um, he still had to work hard and have a lot of self-discipline for it to develop. Yes. And people like myself and uh, most others are not born with the ability. We may have a sensitivity to vibration. We may be... Um, you know, empathic, but you still have to sit in classes and in meditation and uh, you have to do a lot of things to develop. So I, I, ref- I usually use the word ability. But um, anyway, he developed very quickly. And um, he, he he's very interesting. He uh, re- requests to be tied into a chair and so they'll use cat collars to tie his arms to the flat arms of the chair. Then they'll put a tie wrap through the buckle of the cat collar and cinch it down, cut off the excess. <clears throat> These tie wraps are bought at you know right, local hardware store, mm-hmm. um, Home Depot. Then he'll have tie wraps tying his legs, the bottom of his legs, to the chair. He'll have a gag in his mouth, and um, now in the U.S., I, I'm the circle leader, so I, I get to be the one to put the gag on. So I, I'm um, really maximize the humor associated with that experience. You know, oh, my favorite part. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's, he can't speak anymore. That really is to prove for anyone listening that he's not getting out of the chair and he's not throwing his voice to be the voice of, you know, a spirit loved one or a spirit communicator. That's exactly right. They're so, the English are so concerned about the appearance of fraud that they go way, way um, out of their way, at least David does, 
to um, you know to show that he he could not possibly be doing it. Um, he wears a cardigan sweater and he has five small tie wraps down the front of the sweater. Um, with the gag, you put the tie wrap through the knot and then you cinch it around and, and cut off the excess. There's no way to get the tie wrap, I mean, to get the, the gag off of him, out of his mouth, unless you cut the tie wrap. There's no way to get his arms free unless you cut the tie wrap. Right. Because he's, he's tied, he's mm-hmm. tied to the chair. They put him in a cabinet. Now, a cabinet is a four by four foot structure that's got plywood on three sides and a curtain on the fourth side, the front front of it. And the purpose of the of the cabinet is to concentrate the energy that's needed for them to be able to do what they do. Um, spirit, once the ectoplasm is drawn from his body and it comes out mostly through the nose. Um, and, and part of the mouth, I don't may come through the, the ear also, because the gag takes up most of his mouth. Um, <clears throat> it'll pull down by his feet, and then a spirit person will step into it, um, like we said before. And it's um, it coats the the etheric body like iron filings would coat a magnet if you stuck a magnet into a, a pile of iron uh, filings. Mm-hmm. So essentially, they then take on physical form, and they'll walk. William is David's primary teacher, his friend, his primary teacher. He'll come in first, and he'll greet everyone. And you know, he's greeting him with, um, you know, a very distinctive voice. Again, he's using um, <clears throat> the ectoplasm is coating his vocal box, so it's his essentially his voice. And um, he'll ask for questions if anybody has a a non-personal question. And uh, say someone does, he'll walk over to them, and we put a piece of 4 by 8 plywood in the center of the... um, The people are in a horseshoe of chairs. At the open end of that horseshoe is where the cabinet sits. So we'll put a piece of plywood on the floor in the center of all that that circle of chairs. And you'll hear him walking on the plywood, you know, with shoes. And uh, William will walk over to the person that asked the question. He'll answer the question. And then he'll say, Madam or Sir, may I touch you on the top of the head? And they usually will say yes. And he says, describe what you feel, because, you know, it's pitch black in the room. And and, um, they'll say, well, I feel both your hands on my head, which this is the fun part. And you'll say, Madam, that is only one hand. (laughs) (laughs) When the seance is over, check the the medium's hands. They're quite small for for a man. And um, and that they are. So William will answer questions, and then he'll leave. Now, as somebody takes on the ectoplasm and releases it, there's a sound associated with it. It's kind of a whooshing sound, but you get used to it. Uh, you'll you'll know someone's materialized or they've let go of the of the ectoplasm because we need to keep in mind one end of the ectoplasm is still in tied to the inside of David's body. It's the the other part of the ectoplasm that is kind of brought. It's like somebody using sheets to escape a an upper floor you know window. You know. Oh yeah, the good the, description. One end of the sheet is tied into the room that they're leaving, and the rest of it, you know, is being used to to escape. Well, that's what happens with the ectoplasm. The end of it is still in David's body, tied to the pancreas. Um, so then, different guides, different individuals um, that are his part of his spirit team, will come in and do different things. Timmy is the uh, young man. He made the transition, I believe, at the age of nine, and. He works with the ectoplasm. He makes things um, possible by helping the spirit entities with the ectoplasm. But in a a usual seance, lasts about two hours. And I would say 60% of the people that materialize are um, David's spirit team. Now, what's nice 
is that um, Louis Armstrong is part of David's spare team. And he will often come in. And uh, we've been given a, a CD of songs, 10 or 11 songs, that we'll have um, played during the seance. At the beginning of the seance, we're all singing along with the first four songs to build up energy. And then during the seance, we may need to sing some more. And at the end of the seance, we'll sing two songs that help David come out of trance. But oftentimes, Louis will come in and say, um, he'll say, if I'm the circle leader, he'll say, Mr. Tom, can you put on my song? And it's either Hello, Dolly, or It's a Wonderful World. And he'll sing along with it. And he has done this so many times that he's perfected the use of of developing, working with the ectoplasm to to produce his voice the way it sounded on the earth. It's very difficult to do. Incredible. And he's, he's very loud as well. And when I he is. heard him, he was stamping his foot as he was singing. And, uh-huh. and for listeners to keep in mind that everyone in that circle is holding hands. Um, so nobody, nobody breaks the circle, you know, another assurance that this is real spirit phenomena. And could you just describe a little bit about the danger of physical mediumship as, as to, as it relates to why it's in the dark? Yes. Um, white light, um, damages ectoplasm. It's like pouring uh, boiling water on snow. Okay. So. As you say, as a circle leader, when when we hear someone take on the ectoplasm, I will say, everyone hold hands. And um, everyone has been given a three-page consent form, which lets them know what's going to be required. Because if somebody, and then everyone has the instruction, if somebody lets go of your hand, you're to speak to the circle leader immediately. If someone were to reach out and touch a materialized person, it would cause the ectoplasm to snap back into David's body. And um, it oftentimes will cause um, damage to internal organs, or it could cause the death of the medium. And see, this is why there's, well, I've been told by Spirit there's eight, a couple of years ago, there were eight materialization mediums in the world. Um and this is why not that many of them demonstrate to with people they don't know. That's right. Um, here, I've been hosting David, well, in Sarasota. I hosted him um, in 2009, 10, and 11. And um, here, and also 14, and here in Santa Fe, we hosted him in 14, um, 15, and uh, we're scheduled to host him in September of this year, in 18. Um, So I basically vet everyone that comes, because anyone can sign up for a seance. Um, And so David relies on me to talk to the people and and vet them, you know, basically find out why do you want to go to the seance, how'd you hear about it. Um, You know, they want to make sure that Everyone who comes to it is going to be, you know, respectful and behave and, and all of that. Because, you know, and I'll tell them, we have a little pre, pre-seance talk, and I generally give it here in the U.S., and I'll say, you know, our first priority is the, is the health and well-being of the medium. You know, it's got to be. So anyway, um, and people are really good about it, and, uh, every every um, seance is different, but as I mentioned, sixty percent. Oh, sometimes Louis will ask for his harmonica. Have you ever heard him play the harmonica? No. Well, he doesn't do it very often, but sometimes he will, and so he'll say, "Mr. Tom, can I have my harmonica?" So there's a black bag underneath my chair, and I'll reach into it and pull the harmonica out. I hold it on my hand, and I hold my hand up in the air. He'll walk over and take it out of my hand. And he plays a song on the harmonica, which is really amazing. It is. Yeah, totally amazing. So anyway, Quentin Crisp is another one, uh, kind of a famous person. He was a, a pretty famous uh, gay man from from England. And um, 
he will come in and say, I just, I'm here to let you all know that gay and lesbian people don't go to hell when they die. You know, and he's got a wonderful sense of humor. Um, and then, again, we're doing kind of the typical seance. Um, sometimes, if we're really lucky, 20% of the of the seance will be with um, famous people coming in and, and speaking. I've heard um, Abraham Lincoln speak, Winston Churchill, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, Gandhi was very interesting because in the Sarasota Chapel, where the seances are held, they had several sets of Tibetan bells, small bells. Gandhi walked over to that table, which is on the corner of the room, picked up a set of bells. He walked back to the center. He would speak one word, I mean one sentence, about the lack of peace on the earth, and then he would ring the bells. Then another sentence, and then ring the bells. Uh, It was dramatic. It really was dramatic. Sure. Um, I've heard um, Walt Disney come in and talk about the inspiration for Disneyland, heard um, uh, Sir Conan Doyle, Arthur Conan Doyle, mm-hmm. um, Harry Houdini, uh, just a number of Freddie Mercury came in and sang one of his songs, mm-hmm. Queen. And then, if we're, if it's a, if all the energies are flowing right, 20% of the folks that come in, two to three, will be loved ones of people in the room. And that's when it really gets interesting. Oh, keep had, going. <laughs> we a, yeah. yeah, we had a lady um, named Virginia, one of the seances we had in Florida. And she was, oh, at that time, she was probably 80, 80 years old. And um, just a real character. And I knew that her husband's name was Ted. And I knew he had died about five years earlier. So um, William... Either William or Timmy spoke to her, um, but probably during about the middle of the, the total seance, and said, "There's someone here who wants to speak to you." And so he materialized. He walks over across the plywood to Virginia, who was seated about two two seats from me, and he says, "Virginia, do you know who this is?" And she said, "Yes, it's Jean." I thought, Jean, who's that? And so they talked quite a bit. Oh, remember when we used to do this and do that? And and then um, he says, well, I've got to go. There's more people that want to come in. And you hear three kisses, three kisses, and then he's gone. Well, afterward, Virginia, she made the transition last year, but she's not very tall. I'd say five feet. So we'd always have a reception afterward, and for people that were going through it the first time, it was a time for them to talk about it. You know, they're oftentimes kind of shocked with the experience. Yes. In a lovely way, you know, a very nice way. And I said to Virginia, um, I didn't know that, I didn't know you were married twice. She said, oh yeah, Gene was my first husband, and he died in a car accident at the age of 26. And she said, and I said, well, what was the kissing? I heard three kisses. And she said every morning as he would leave the house to go to work, he'd kiss me three times on the top of the head because we had three children, you know. Mm-hmm. And here I was, the minister, and she and I were very close friends. I never knew that. Mm-hmm. Very you know, special. Of course, Dave, David would never know that. No. I mean, nobody in the room knew that. Uh, only the people in the spirit world. Mm-hmm. But uh, dramatic, dramatic. There was another uh, couple. Normally, I mean, David will, which is really cool. I mean, William is standing right next to him, but you're, you're, you know, you're wanted to make sure you have no objects in your pockets. And again, no recorders, no transmitters, none of that stuff. Um, and then David will place you in the the um, circle. It's you know, it's a three quarters of a circle according to your energy. And William will say, put this person here, this person there. So normally husband and wives aren't always next to each other. You know, if they're in one energy is a certain way and it, you know, it's compatible in another area, he just places them accordingly. Well, there was a couple from New Jersey and I had vetted them 
and other Nana didn't know anything about them. They were seated next to each other. And um, during the middle of the seance, it's a different one than when Virginia was in. Um, William William says, um, there's someone here who wants to speak with you. And apparently their 20-year-old son uh, was in spirit. And within the past year, he had been um, hit by a truck where the driver was um, high on, on drugs. And um, he lost control, and it went off the sidewalk and hit their son walking home uh, from work and killed him. So he came in, and he was just so thrilled. His mother was just, he talked to her first, and she was beside herself, as you would imagine. He hugs her, you know, and says, I love you, and and physically hugs her. Now, they can do something with the ectoplasm that. It can they can touch you, but they have somehow protected the ectoplasm so it doesn't coil back into David's body. So um, then then he's he starts talking to his dad, and he says, he, you know, greeted his dad and how are you doing and all this, and he says, Dad, you've got to promise me you won't do it. And his dad said, No, I can't do that. Uh, oh yes, you you need to. What about you know Frank, the younger brother? Um, it would be devastating for Frank to go through that experience, um, and Mom too. And so they, you know, go back and forth for a good five minutes, and then ultimately the dad says, "Okay, I promise. I'll promise you, I won't do it." Well, what he was planning to do was to kill the guy that killed his son. Oh my! You know, his wife didn't know it. Um, he gave a testimonial after the seance was over and um, said that his son had talked to him. He was so grief-stricken that, um, you know, prior to coming to the seance, but Spirit knew what he was going to do, mm-hmm. what he was planning to do. And so that was that was really a dramatic instance where an intervention saved, you know, him to doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Tom, what I think is important to, to all of us is, as you know, I love the phenomena, and there's no guarantees, obviously, that a loved one will come through. But right. if the circumstances are are right and it happens, even though maybe one person gets that communication, it really hits home that all of our loved ones are in the spirit world. They are all safe. They are all fine. And as sitters in seances, we're very much active participants. If you don't know the song, the words to a song, you sing la, 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 la. I mean, to build up energy. And I think the more, I mean, obviously there's many, um, prob- well, from the spirit side, different combination of things to make all these things happen but i know from our human side you know anything we can do to add energy and i think that's why there's so much humor because there's a lot of energy and laughter right no you're exactly right and um i was uh and and you know i had i've had personal communications that meant the world to me you know, and I've seen it many I've sat in forty nine of David's seances with full materialization in four different countries. Wow, that's terrific. And I can see the difference. You know, I talk to the people afterwards and um everyone has changed. I I would venture to say that, to state that. Everyone has changed by the experience. And uh, you know, um there, as you, we mentioned earlier, there's great intelligence on the other side of life. There are no demons. There are no devils. You know, um, there just aren't. There are people in the spirit world that are ignorant that may not be as evolved as uh, others may be. But um, there's no forces of evil out there waiting to, you know, trick us or trip us up or do any of that stuff. That's kind of nonsense. Um, but what happens, we bring David, uh, we couldn't bring him last year because he had um, he had just changed jobs and he'd gotten a full-time job um, and they're in Auckland and he didn't have the vacation days. But he, I guess he's been twice to, to Santa Fe and he'll be coming here in September. 
watching our website, he is he was going to do four seances. They sold out in two weeks. Um, we've just added a fifth one, and that sold out. But um, what I would recommend, if someone, any of your listeners is interested in going to a David Thompson seance, they're like the 18th, 19th, 20th, 22nd, 23rd of September, they can email me. And my email is tnewman, N-E-W-M-A-N, at G-T-E dot net. And they can ask to be put on the wait list. Because when we just added this this uh, extra seance a week, week and a half ago, because there were so many people on the wait list. That's right. Well, yeah. now the wait list is, is, is done. It's empty. So if somebody were to um, cancel for some reason, and there's always, you know, life gets in the way mm-hmm. sometimes, then we could go to the next person. Um, the fee is is reasonable, um, but this is an experience that will change one's life. That's right. And um, I, you know, I have experienced almost every type of phenomena, physical phenomena in the world that spirit people can do. And this I put right at the top of the list. Yeah, Tom, I just uh, want to add to the listener right now. Uh, we are doing, and if you've listened to other episodes, there's going to be an afterlife symposium that's also happening in September before David visits you. He will be presenting a couple of workshops and even do a trance demonstration at the afterlife symposium. And on the Friday night and Saturday night, which is 15th and 16th, there will be two seances. Now, it's not technically connected with the symposium, but a lot of the people you see at the symposium will be there, and there are still some places left. And if you, our listener, are coming to the symposium and are interested in attending a seance, I'm going to ask you to email me directly, which is Sandra Champlain at gmail.com, and just write in the subject line, seance application because as Tom mentioned the vetting process I actually have an application that's got David's information about what to expect Um, and you know you have to be comfortable with loud noises and sitting in the dark and holding hands and uh, there are are times that you can stretch of course but uh, many of the times you're sitting holding hands but if you are interested there are still some spots available at the symposium uh, or in Scottsdale, Arizona, I'll put it to you that way, because it's not at the hotel for the symposium. It's about half hour away. But just email me, sandrachamplain at gmail.com, and just put seance application. And no strings attached. I'm happy to send the application, and you choose if that's something you might be interested in or not. So, um, yeah. So there are time, there are opportunities to see David. And Tom, I'm sure, like me, those that may not get the experience this time we're going to hang on to your email address for the next time it comes around right now i will be there with with him for that conference um again i'll be the circle leader i'm in charge of the humans and then spirit yes. people have people in charge of the spirits um but again it's a um you know it's an experience that uh is it's um it's reassuring you know, and refreshing, and and one of the things I I enjoy a good sense of humor. I like to laugh and, um, you know, laugh at situations that don't make fun at people's differences, but it it may um, just um, bring to light some of the idiosyncrasies we as humans, you know, get involved in. But um, the spirit people have great sense of humor, also most of them. And it's fun to to laugh, just like you said. It's just fun to to laugh. I've you know we had one of the now keep in mind when the spirit, the last spirit, which William will come in at the end of the seance and say goodbye to everyone, and then he releases. He'll say, um, "Put on the coming out songs." He'll release the um, ectoplasm, goes back into David's body, and then um, we sing two songs, and then. I'll say, David, are you okay? And you'll hear, oh, you know, he's got the gag. Right, yes, he does. But I have a little flashlight in my pocket that I have disassembled. I reassemble it because there's no light in the room at all, no lamps, nothing. The power's been turned off. I mean, the light switch power. 
and then we we'll find him. And I, I won't tell you how we find him, but I'll let that be a surprise. But it's amazing how we find him sometimes. But in uh, Holland, um, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was there, and the circle leader was Steve Burns, who's out of uh, Scotland. And uh, he apparently brought a piece of chocolate for Timmy, David's um, very rambunctious guy. It was very funny. And um, Timmy comes in after William had done his questions and answers and said, said, Mr. Ken, where's my sweetie? He called it a his little chocolate piece of chocolate, a sweetie. And, and, and Steve said, well, I put it over there by the cabinet. Oh, Bobby Ray must have gotten it. You know, <laughs> you know. So the next night, he kept it in his pocket until Timmy asked him for it, and he said, "Tim, I have it here in my hand." And he held it out to him. Timmy walked over, and he had little little feet. So he had this, you know, kind of this real quick patter of feet going over to where Steve was, and he gets the chocolates wrapped in foil. So you hear the unwrapping of the foil. You hear this. Mmm, that is so, so funny. good. <laughs> I, I said to Steve afterward, I said, where does that chocolate go? <laughs> it goes, goes into the ectoplasm back in the David's body. That's right. That's right. But it was hilarious. Uh, we we had to duplicate that um, for David when he was here a year and a half ago. We we did that with with Timmy too, and he liked the chocolate we had chosen. Oh, it's such a special thing! And Tom, our time goes by so quick on this interview. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind if you touched a little bit about uh, you and the, some of, maybe some of the classes you teach. And um, I know you might not be as busy teaching as you were in the past, but how can people find out about you? What kind of things are on your website? If you could share that. Yeah, sure. That's a great that's a great um, request there. Um, basically, I teach mediumship classes, and periodically I'll do workshops uh, here. I'm teaching at Lily Dale in in August, doing two workshops, and Mary Tory is a, a wonderful host and medium up in Denver, and I've taught there two years. Um, also, the the big thing we do, and again, you can find this out by going to the website teachings with an S of the angels dot com. Um, I bring in seven or eight mediums from all over the world uh, every year. And so in addition to David Thompson, um, we brought in John White this year, who is a just extraordinary medium and teacher out of Lilydale. He's been there. I've worked with him for nine years. Uh, Tony Winninger is here now. She's out of Chicago. She's a clear conscious channel and, and has channeled 10 books in addition to doing readings and classes. Nicole de Haas is a wonderful medium and teacher from yes. Holland. She's been on the show. She's coming in. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. She's coming in September. She's delightful. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, oh, let's see, uh, the Archangel Gabriel transfers through Karen Cook. They're, they're here for three workshops um, during the year. Um, Eric Cargill is another one that comes here. He's a, um, a wonderful deep trance medium. And so, and then we, what we try to do, uh, Philip Dykes, who is a teacher out of England, he'll be coming next year. Um, Jackie Wright is out of England also. She's an Arthur Finley tutor and also teaches at uh, Holland, the um, Schwanhof. She'll be coming in the end of July for about four days, five days, first time for her. So we try to bring in somebody once a month or once every six weeks. And um, and I, I like to say that we're looking at people that can teach the higher spiritual teachings. Um, and um, so that's kind of a criteria. And my, my litmus test is I want to see them demonstrate before I would bring them here. I don't, as a rule, bring anybody here that I've not seen them work beforehand. That makes sense. Because, yeah, it's you know, it's my reputation. If I'm saying to local people, this is a good teacher, um, I need to be assured of that. Mm-hmm. Because they're, um, all these teachers come in and they offer, oh, wait, Robinette is another one. He's a fantastic spirit art guard medium. The only one in the world that can 
demonstrate to the level that he does, he, he and his spirit team do. Will you take a minute and um, just share what Hoyt Robinette does? I've never witnessed him, but I've heard great stories and uh might be time to take a trip to Santa Fe when he comes into town. Yeah, we... um We've had him here three times. He was scheduled to come in in, in April, the middle of April, and his partner um, was dealing with an illness, uh, got seriously ill and had to cancel. But I saw him in Denver. He went to Denver for five nights, and then he was to come here. But he basically has a basket, um, very tightly woven basket. Um, how, much, how much time do I have? You have enough time to tell the story. I won't okay. cut you off. This is important, I okay. think. Yeah, he's a tightly woven basket, and he'll show it to you, and it's empty. And then he'll take a pack of three by five index cards, and there he'll open it in front of everybody. He'll hand it to somebody that he doesn't know. He'll say, "Check those cards and see if there are any markings on any of the cards." Of course, there aren't. I'm buying at local office supply store. Then he drops a third of the cards into the basket, just drops them in, random. He takes two handfuls of markers, um, colored pens, Sharpie um, markers, uh, colored, uh, let's see, pastel crayons, and he'll drop those on top of the cards. Then he'll take another third of the cards, drop them in, more markers, another third of the cards, and then more markers on top of that. Then he puts a lid on the basket, and this is in, in the, the light, but the basket is totally dark. There's no light penetrating the basket. But we do, he'll allow 25 people in a card circle. So we do them in my home. So we don't have the basket on the dining room table, right there in front of all of us. And then everyone has a billet, which is about a three inch by four inch piece of paper. And this is an old spiritualist tradition where they would write the loved, names of loved ones in spirit write their full names um, on the first part of the billet, write a question, personal question, then sign their name, fold them over, they're picked up. He dumps them into a wooden box that he has with a two-inch edge around it. He puts on medical tape across his eyes, two long horizontal pieces and then two diagonal pieces. Then he puts on a black mask uh, so he can't see. Um, he pick up, he'll pick up about 10 billets in his left hand, and then he'll take one at a time, and he'll say, I have a James here, I have a Dr. Meredith here, I have a Peggy here, I have a Benny. And whoever can take those names would say, I can take that. And then he gives you more names. And it could be names, oh, your grandmother Ingrid wants to know why you didn't put her name on your billet. You know, mm-hmm. it'd be, he'll give you the names of other people that are there from the spirit world. Right. Then they give him the answer to the question, and he gives it to you in a way that no one can tell what the question was. And then once he's finished with that, he takes the bill and drops it in the box, goes to the next one. It takes an hour to do that. Then he takes off the tape and the mask, opens the basket, which has been sitting in front of all of us, and he pulls out the cards, and there'll be a card for everybody in the room. On one side of the card will be names written. Your name is written in the center of the card, printed or cursive. The names will be in all different um, sizes, different colors. And uh, on the other side of the card is a painting, a painting, full painting, that is generally one of your spirit guides. Now, it could be, it could be something else. We've had some special ones. I had um, Buddha came in, you know, answered the question through Hoyt for me on my billet. And then Buddha said to him, um, on your card will be a picture of my village. People on the earth don't know what my village looked like. So on my card, which I have on the website, a picture of it, is a picture of a town that's surrounded by a huge wall. Very detailed picture in beautiful oranges and reds and yellows. Uh, it's just magnificent. But again, most people will have a picture of a guide there. But the first year he was here, we had some, a lot of famous pictures like Elvis Presley, Lyndon B. Johnson, Theodore Roosevelt, St. Uh, Christopher, St. Um, Paul. One lady had a picture of 
of um, St. Peter cradling the head of Jesus after the crucifixion. Um, and see, if you get a famous person on your card, there's a reason for that. You were either with that person in another lifetime, you could be a student of that person in this lifetime, or there's some other connection. But it is absolutely, I've done it 20 times, it is absolutely dramatic. It has to be. And 20 times is enough to know there's no sleight of hand going on. And I think you no. know as well as I do some of the uh, top physical mediums in the world. And, you know, our friend Scott Milligan, who you know well, has been uh-huh. on this show many times. Um, th- these are people that have other jobs. They're not getting rich, conning people with... Uh, you know, the sleight of hands. Not to say there aren't con artists out there, but I think you can see the humility of the mediums that we're talking about with what they do for a living and, you know, how much they do give. So it's pretty spectacular. Well, you know, you're exactly right. And that's one of the criteria that I use. They have to have a connection to the spirit world before I bring them here to Santa Fe. And, um, everyone's entitled to earn a living. None of these people make a killing. Um, and and they're, they're serving as instruments of the divine power and the angels of light. And their interest is um, helping to bring the truth of the spirit world and our reality to us. So it's, um, yeah, in fact, David... What David Thompson did, sometimes you can get a card by proxy. You don't have to be present to win, so to speak. Um, you pay the fee and you turn in a billet. David, the first time, David's done it twice. Um, the first time, he misspelled on the billet a couple of his guides' names. Well, on the card, they were spelled correctly. Very interesting. <laughs> and see, nobody, I mean, nobody would know that. No. That was his little test, and I don't, you know, I I don't test him like that, but, you know, that was something he wanted to do, so he's very much a believer in Oid, let me tell you. Oh, Oid that's Robin great. Ed. Oh, Tom, yeah. thank you so much Please. for being our guest today. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it, and, uh, you know, I can't be too enthusiastic about uh, what a wonderful experience it is to to be in the presence of spirit and see the things that they can do under, it, under the right circumstances. It is life changing. It is to go from a believing thanks, to knowing. That's what I like to say. Well, that's a great way to put it. And thanks for being an instrument of the spirit world and getting the word out. You never know whose life you're going to touch with your radio show. So kudos to you. Oh, thank you. And ditto right back to you. Cause you have been, of service to the spirit world and your fellow humans for a long, long time. And yeah, it's just, you're a special man and I'm looking forward to giving you a big hug when I see you in September. (laughs) Me too. Me too. I'll be there. So once again, your website is teachingsoftheangels.com. Right. And you want to repeat your email address if somebody's interested in being on that wait list for the same. Yeah, it's T T Newman, N E W M A N T for Tom, um, at G T E, the old telephone company, dot net. Perfect. And if anyone's interested in attending the symposium, the website is afterlifesymposium.org. You can find out more, both Scott Milligan and David Thompson will be doing workshops and lectures and trance demonstrations, but there will be some seances going on. And if you're interested in filling out an application to attend, there are still some spaces available for sure. uh, As of this date that we're recording this in June, 2018. And my email address is Sandra Champlain at gmail.com. And you could be listening to this interview a year from now And I still, if you're interested in this, I will keep you updated. In fact, our home base for this website is wedontdieradio.com. And a little pop-up will come, Join Sandra's Insiders Club, which I give you a few freebies that are pretty cool, I would say, there. And I don't send you a lot of email. I don't bother you. But if there are special occasions that pop up, say, um, 
one of these mediums coming to town or something that I think would be important for you to share, I certainly will keep you posted on that. So uh, what else do I want to tell you? A big thanks again to Tom Newman, our guest, and go to his website, teachingsoftheangels.com, and you will see a picture right on the home screen of this fine man uh, bungee jumping. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, uh, Tom, I do believe, really, that once we embrace the reality of the afterlife, you start thinking, well, who am I? What is my life for? And without the fear of dying, you don't have to have a fear of living. And for you to jump off, whatever you jumped off, uh, that shows that you, you really embraced and were courageous. And it was probably exhilarating, wasn't it? It was. It was a bridge in New Zealand where they first started the bungee jumping wow. 25 years ago, the South Island. Kudos to you. And you're right. You know, the um, the investigation into the physical phenomena, it opens the door to a world of knowledge that we don't have much access to. There are some books that, that will cover bits and pieces of it, but, you know, it's uh, you can spend a whole lifetime just learning the mysteries of life. Mm-hmm. In which will enrich our own lives. So it's wonderful. Yeah. It, it removes fear, and fear is, is probably the greatest deterrent or you know um, adversary we have, especially about what happens after we die. Mm-hmm. We go home. We go home. There's we parties. Go there's home. reunions. <laughs> I I heard it great from actually one of the race car drivers that I know. I my day job, Tom, is I'm a caterer for race car teams, but he had. Oh, I thought you could say you're a mechanic. No. Nope. For- race cars no caterer <laughs> the chef but after okay. my book came out uh i started I had a little table at the racetrack that i was signing books and he says you know what is this all about sandra you know, why, why are you talking about life after death and i told him my story and he said to me when he was in his 20s he was in a terrible car accident and he ended up going to the hospital, flatlined on the operating table, and he said, I was greeted by my grandmother and my grandfather, and it was so real, it made my life on earth seem like just a dream. And mm. he got to choose whether to continue on with his grandparents or come back to earth, and he saw his brother and mom and dad praying by his bedside. He ended up going into a, a coma after they revived him, and he knew the right thing would be to go come back to earth but he said when he did he said knowing that the afterlife was so real he said i didn't have to be really afraid to live so this man put his foot to the pedal in this race car and all the race cars that he drove and he won many 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 championships very well thought of race car driver and that's exactly what he had told me without the fear of dying you don't have to have the fear of living and so i love that story and i love that we go home our life on Earth will mm-hmm. seem like just a dream, you know, and um, mm-hmm. it's all part of the progression for our souls. Yes. Yeah. It is, exactly. Yep. It's the grand design. Oh, well, lots of love to you, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you. And same to you. Thank you. It's so nice spending some time with you. And we'll do more. And for our listener, thank you for spending the time with us. Really do appreciate it. Um, in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I always feel so honored to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on Earth is important. Really want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. 